touchy subject matters of our day is the word commitment. Uh, people say, you know, some people have commitment issues and people uh, have trouble committing to responsibilities for the future. Anything that's beyond right now, uh, people are hesitant to agree to sometimes. And um, some of those decisions that we make now that, that hold us accountable for long periods of time, we might hesitate on. It might begin with uh, a first job, you know, when you take a job, you get excited about the pay, but there's also the work that's involved. And am I committed uh, to giving up this personal time in order to be at this work location and to make uh, this, this kind of effort uh, in order to get that money? Or it might even be volunteering for something. Am I willing to do what I say I'm going to do? And then sometimes things are more official where they, they involve signatures and contracts that are legally binding. For many people that, that first big contract might be uh, some sort of a car loan and so there's going to be w some things to consider. You know, what is my, how stable is my income? What's my budget look like? How, how am I going to be able to make this commitment? If this commitment's five years, uh, am I willing to do that? And then if you go to buy a home, many people are making a commitment for 30 years. And so you're going to want to think about that. Is this the house that I want to live in and make payments on for 30 years? And then even beyond that, we think about the traditional marriage vows. Until death do us part. That is a lifetime commitment. Is this the person that I want to marry? Are we in love with each other? Is this God's will for our lives? And so there's all of these, these questions and that really should be asked and should be answered before we would enter into a commitment like that because uh, it's even part of the marriage vows that uh, this is not something to be taken lightly. And so that's even part of the, of the traditional marriage vows. And then so when we think about all of the credit checks and all of the background checks that are go, go into employment and just purchasing an automobile that's going to depreciate and not last very long in the grand scheme of things, shouldn't when we talk about our relationship with Jesus Christ, shouldn't we also be putting a lot of thought into this, a lot of effort and to realize this is not something to be taken lightly. There is a commitment. There is a cost to discipleship. Let's look together in Matthew chapter 8, looking at verse 18. It says, And when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. So he has preached the Sermon on the Mount. He got done with that extremely long message and then he was immediately approached by a leper that wanted cleansed by a centurion servant who wanted one of his servants uh, healed he w walks into Peter's house and Peter's mother-in-law is dying and he heals her and then they bring him people that are demon possessed and sick and he heals them Jesus is exhausted the needs of people are unending and he needs time to rest to sleep and also to invest privately with his disciples. And so that's why he gives a command. Hey, let's depart and go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee there in verse 18. And then in verse 19, as he's, as he's telling his disciples, hey, we're going to depart to the other side. One of the other ones that's listening thinks, well, hey, I'd, I'd like to go. I, I, why can't I be one of the disciples? So in verse 19 it says, Then a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. That is a bold statement. Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. But it's easier to make bold statements than it is to live them out, isn't it? That's why you'll hear that saying that talk is cheap. In verse 20, Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So 
So what can we infer from that? The scribe said, said the right things. But Jesus, who knows everything, knows that he blurted out something that sounded good, but that he had not counted the cost. He's reminded him as he uses these illustrations of the fox and the birds of the air that uh, they might have somewhere they call home, but that Jesus' disciples don't have everything situated like that. Like even their very next place they lay their head might be unknown at that time. And so he's calling attention to, that's easy for you to say that, but have you really given it thought about the comforts that you may not be guaranteed? And, and um, the New American Commentary points out here that Jesus had a home in Capernaum, even if it was a borrowed one, but he was often not there to use it. At a deeper level, Jesus' disciples must recognize that no location on earth affords a true home. Our citizenship is in heaven, and that verse comes from uh, Philippians 3.20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the point he's making is, is he's questioning his statement, are you really willing to sacrifice some of the comforts that you have come accustomed to? Are you really willing to simply follow Jesus without reservation? Are you, are you willing to walk away from everything that gives you security right now? Your home, your family, your income, you getting to choose where you live. And, and as a, um, when I was called to ministry uh, as a pastor, um, I have followed Jesus wherever he is called. I, I didn't say, you know, Jesus, I'll serve you as long as it's within this 10-mile this radius right here. And some of the people that I know in ministry that have picked where they wanted to be have not stayed in the ministry. Um, as soon as they couldn't get called to serve right where their hometown was, they just got another job. And that was it. And uh, to me, it is about saying, hey, if God called me a pastor, then he gets to decide where I pastor. He's the one that decided I was going to serve him. It makes sense that he would decide where that's going to happen. And so that statement, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. The scribe responded without considering or understanding what he was committing to. He made a hasty commitment, which sounds impressive, but promising things that we don't deliver on is not admirable. I want you to think about that. Promising to do things that we don't deliver on is not admirable. So we need to give some thoughts to our excitement when we make a commitment. Thinking back to our previous examples, if you agree to accept a job, but you don't show up for work, you're going to disappoint a lot of people. They're going to say, wow, that, that person did not keep their word. If you sign on the dotted line of a five-year car loan, and you haven't really counted the cost, that's not going to be the happy thing that it might have been on day one. So if you're not looking to buy a car, you don't really need one, but you run across one of those deals that's just too good to pass up, or you find yourself saying things like, it would have been stupid not to buy the car. Then you might want to think about it. You know, is this something that I'm just excited about because my car has broken things on it? This one has everything that works. I look good in that car. Well, in three years, that warranty is going to run out. You got two more years of payments. Is that the right decision? And so um, we have to count the cost and recognize that it is a commitment. It is a legally binding commitment. What if you uh, have a boyfriend or girlfriend and let's just say that uh, we're talking about a female who has a boyfriend and, and she, she likes him. Uh, she thinks that their relationship is going well, but then he asks her to marry her, and it's kind of early. I mean, they really don't know each other that well. They just they just kind of like each other, and she doesn't want to offend him, uh, but she wasn't expecting it, and now she has a decision to make. 
Maybe it was one of those guys that figures, hey, if I ask her during a baseball game and we're, we're on the big screen out in the outfield, I mean, she's got to say yes, right? And I don't know if you've ever seen those videos where the girl says no. Uh, yeah, that's painful. Uh, everybody's watching. And, but you have a decision to make. And are you going to get caught up in the pressure of, oh, what if, what if I say no and then he breaks up with me and then I lost a a good person or whatever, you can't think like that. You've got to say, you know, what, what does God want me to do? This is a tell death do us part thing. This is not something to rush into uh, because somebody asks. And so remember, promising things that we don't deliver on is not admirable. So we have to really think and say, you know, this is part of my, my character. This is part of my testimony as a person to be a man of my word, to be a person of your word. And so, when it comes to our relationship with Jesus, Jesus is letting the scribe know that his disciples, those that choose to follow him, are putting Jesus as their first priority. And I don't think sometimes we pause long enough to really think about that. Jesus is our first priority. Comes before everything else, including our home, where we live, what our family wants us to be, what our family wants us to do, where our family wants us to live. And those are real. Uh, and the older you get, uh, it doesn't get easier. You know, you end up um, having memories of growing, growing up close to your family and all that. And now, you know, we've been blessed to have good church families that love our kids and all. But, you know, our kids haven't grown up around their family because they've grown up wherever God has us. So we're far away uh, from relatives and all that. And, and so um, our relationship with our church family, you know, is special. And we continue, you know, it takes a concerted effort to keep up your relationships with your family when you don't live close. But Jesus knows... This scribe hasn't really thought things through. Uh, the scribe was not ready. And this is what's wrong with um, guilt trip altar calls. Uh, guilt trip uh, calls to salvation. Guilt trip calls to ministry. People not being honest about the commitment that is required. He was not ready to live out this bold statement. And Jesus knew that. And then he goes on to another scenario. So in the first scenario, the person was over-eager, over-anxious, didn't take the commitment serious enough, so kind of jumped right into it, let his words kind of get ahead of his, uh, his heart and his brain and everything. So now we have the opposite problem in verse 21. Then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Well, that's just rude. That doesn't sound well, does it? Uh, so what's going on here? So commentaries offer various explanations. But we're going to get into what was probably happening here and why to us it sounds harsh, but why it really wasn't. It's, it's making the same point that he made with the first example, that Jesus is to be first. So, it might help us realize that Jesus wasn't being rude when we realize that this man's father was still alive. Uh, how, how would we know that? Well, uh, the har uh, referring to burial practices of this time period, a Harper's Bible Dictionary states, because of the warm climate of Palestine and the popular belief that a dead body was ritually impure, burial usually took place as soon after death as possible, usually within 24 hours. So this would have only been a harsh response if the man's father had just died and they were like burying him that day. But if that was the case, he wouldn't have been hanging out with Jesus and his disciples. He would have been tending to his father's burial. And so there's a couple of things that we can kind of look into 
these excuses. This is, we're, we're guilty of that. How many times have you either heard yourself say or heard someone else say, well, you know, uh, I feel like God wants me to do this, but, well, you know, we're going to have to wait till the kids are grown. Um, or, you know, well, I feel like God wants me to do this, but I'm going to have to wait till I retire, you know. And, um, and then after that, it's like, well, and I don't have enough in my retirement savings to do that, so I'll have to wait till we hit this, this number. And basically what, what people are saying is, I want to serve God when it doesn't cost me anything. I want to get some things that I want, my security on this earth, I want to get settled so that I can do whatever God wants me to do, but I've already taken care of everything. There's really nothing that can happen that can put me in a bad way. So, so what does that mean for most people? For most people, it means they'll never do it. Because if we had what we felt we needed to be financially secure, most of us never get there. It's just not going to happen. And it really comes down to a lack of faith. So there's a couple of things that could be happening. They're both bad, but let's talk about them. One could be that he's ashamed to tell his family, especially his father, the head of his household, that he wants to follow Jesus. That he's not going to continue on in the family's religion. And he's afraid of his father, knowing he's not going to get his blessing. And the other could just be a delayed tactic. You know, well, you know, I, I really want to please Jesus, but I, I've got these responsibilities. And so ultimately the problem is, is that there's something coming first before Jesus. He even uses the wording... Let me first do this. Jesus, right off the bat, you're not first. Jesus is saying, that's not going to happen. It's, it's not going to work that way. Jesus requires our immediate response and our full commitment. His calling is too important to delay our response. It, it is a matter of life and death. I mean, after all, that's what Jesus' calling is, is to be ambassadors of Christ. It's to put Him first. It's to be a Christ follower. There's also something else that we can learn, is that whenever we follow Jesus, we have this uh, tension going on inside, this balance of responsibility to our family and our commitment to God. Because Jesus was very clear that he is to be first, even over mother, father, spouse, children. We are to love him most. But he's also very clear in the scripture that we are to be people of our responsibilities. We're not to walk away. We talked last week how even though uh, Peter was called to drop everything and follow Jesus, we see uh, in last week's scripture that he had a home and his mother-in-law was living there. So Peter had a wife, he had a home, he had a family, was taking care of his mother-in-law. So we see that Jesus' call was for Jesus to be first, but it didn't mean that Peter went home and divorced his wife and told her that, that he couldn't ever see her again because Jesus had called him and that uh, they were just on their own for, for food and money and all that because... Jesus uh, called them and Jesus would be his excuse for being, um, not being a provider. He didn't do that. He kept his commitments to care and provide. But he also trusted Jesus to provide for those needs and to follow him and, and he did that. And so there are things that we need to realize that God's calling on your life is not going to conflict with itself. So if he's called you to have a family, uh, if he's called you to have a spouse or children, and he's also called you to serve him, those aren't going to conflict. They're going to work together. But we, it only works when we put him first. It doesn't work when we say, well, I'm going to have to wait until this happens 
so that I can do that. I remember when uh, God called us to ministry. I was an engineer, my wife was a nurse, and um, our church family was so excited for us. We were both going to quit our jobs and move to North Carolina from Arkansas, a place where we literally knew no one, didn't know where we were going to live, knew that we were going to go from gaining an income to paying to go to school, and didn't have any guarantees. We didn't have any uh, financial help with school in any way, not all the way through. And we just, you know, probably uh, didn't think a lot about that until people started saying doubtful things to us. Some pretty bluntly, well, that's just stupid. Christian people. Well, couldn't you just kind of keep doing what you're doing, serving at the church and like keep your job and your income and like, you just hear me? I said God wants us to do that. But that's that human nature is control, comfort, saying let me get this guaranteed so that I'm really not risking anything. And for a lot of people, you'll go through this just when you make that commitment to be saved. It's, I'm going to tell my family, when I'm baptized, I'm, I'm up in front of a church body, proclaiming my public profession of faith. Some people go through that, they might have been in church uh, for decades. What are people going to think about me? They already thought I was saved. And, well, they're going to rejoice with you. Got to get over that. What are people going to think? What is God going to think? Publicly profess your faith in Him. Well, all, some of these other people getting baptized are kids. I'm an adult. What are, what are people going to think? They're going to be thankful that you were faithful. What about your family? Maybe they have a different religious background than you do. Just don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What a witnessing opportunity. What if it causes you problems at work because some of the habits that your work might be involved in conflict with your faith and you're not able to participate in some things that could cost you a promotion it might even cost you your job it most certainly will cost you some people that you call friends that may not be are we willing to count the cost are we willing to take things serious are we willing to say God there's some things in my life that are just flat out disobedient to you and am I willing to change any of those or am I going to use your grace as an excuse for my sin? Or am I going to say, you know, God wants me to stop doing this. So I'm going to stop doing it. So there's this commitment of not being too slow to, re too slow to respond. Not being too quick to respond. Think things through. God, what am I actually committing to here? And so... Part of the problem with that is that we are so excited to see people get saved, so excited to see people baptized, that sometimes the whole story isn't shared. We are to believe the gospel, that Jesus is God, that he died on the cross to pay for our sins, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, and we, we worship a risen, living Savior. He's alive today. That is the gospel. Well, if that's all we do, we're not done yet. The devil believes all that. Believes that Jesus is God. The devil knows that. The devil knows that he died on the cross to pay for our sins. The devil saw him be buried the devil was extremely disappointed when he was resurrected. But the devil doesn't follow. The devil doesn't love Jesus. The devil doesn't obey Jesus. And so that's where it's not really the whole story until we talk about the commitment that we're making. That there is a cost of discipleship. There has to be in us and not only an understanding of the gospel message that we're sinners in need of forgiveness, that Jesus is the one and only way to heaven, but along with that, God, I want to please you. 
I want to follow you. I want you to be first place in my life. God, I'm willing to not only repent of my sin, but God, I'm going to commit my life to following you. That first step is to be, not be ashamed to be baptized in front of my church family. But that's just the first step. Then it's having my relationship with you make a difference in all of my decisions I make, all of my relationships that I have, how I respond, what kind of employee I am, what kind of husband I am, what kind of son I am, what kind of father I am, what kind of person I am, what kind of neighbor I am, how I treat other people. So, sometimes I think we uh, sort of wash over the cost on our part because it pales in comparison to what we gain and to the cost that Jesus paid. But in this passage in particular, Jesus touches on it. He wants us to think about it. What is it costing us? What kind of changes would Jesus require of us? So then we'd ask, well, is it worth it? Well, let's see. What do I gain from submitting my life to Christ? What do I what changes happen when I become a believer? Well, salvation. Just that freedom of knowing that your sins are paid for by Jesus. That it's not about your works or what you did, but it's all about Him and what He did for you. That freedom, that innocence that's regained. The forgiveness of sins knowing that no matter what happens in this life, that when I die, I go on to live for all eternity in heaven with Him. Those are pretty good things, aren't they, so far? Having that personal relationship with Jesus Christ, an opportunity to live a life that matters for all eternity and to help other people. So absolutely it's worth it. But I have to be willing to count the cost and say, God, I know you're not going to let me stay the same. I know there are things that you're going to change about me, and I want you to do that. I invite you to do that. So as we prepare in just a moment, we're going to have an invitation, and then we're going to partake of our Lord's Supper. We think about what Jesus did on the cross, and that He counted the cost of what it would cost Him to die for us on the cross. In later on in Matthew, in verse in uh, chapter twenty six, verse twenty six, says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, "Take, eat, this is my body." Then he took the cup, and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, "Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many, for the remission." of sins but I say to you I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom and when they had sung a hymn they went out to the Mount of Olives this was just prior to them going to the garden to pray Jesus getting arrested uh, the illegal midnight trial him getting uh, scourged and beaten on his way to the cross him dying on the cross this all would have happened on Thursday night. He would have died on the cross on that Friday. And so he's letting them know, this is what I'm going to do for you. So when we think about Jesus counting the cost, the cost of being our Lord and Savior, he as God in the flesh, he counted that cost before the creation of the world when he had it in him to have a personal relationship with us, to create man in his own image, to have a relationship with us, he knew we would sin. He knew that the only way we could be restored and not eternally separated was to pay for our sin through his blood. So again, when we think about what we pay by just giving up some sort of habit or lifestyle, it pales in comparison to what Jesus gave up. And that's why we need to avoid finding someone, because it's not easy to find someone to tell you that you're actually not sinning, that, that what you're doing is normal and okay. 
You don't need that. You need somebody to tell you the truth. That our sin separates us from a holy God. And that whatever pain, whatever change it would take to change your lifestyle is well worth it when we think about what we gain in a holy relationship with a holy God. We're going to pray and we're going to take the Lord's Supper in after, after our invitation. So during our invitation, that's a time for you to respond. It's a time for you to come to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ if you don't have one. You want to come and pray with Brother Brandon or myself and just say, hey, I want to, I want to know Jesus. I want to be saved. There's two main purposes of the Lord's Supper. The first one is to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made. That's why he did this with his disciples. Take this bread. Take this cup. When we take the bread, we're remembering the body, the, the pain and suffering that Jesus went through. When we take the blood, we're reminded of the, what he went through on the cross and that that holy blood of Christ was absolutely necessary for the forgiveness of our sins. But he also gives us another reason in 1 Corinthians 11, and that's one of self-examination, to put ourselves on trial before God and say, God, show me areas of my life that are not pleasing to you and help me to remedy those. If that involves me going to a, a brother or a sister and asking for forgiveness or making restoration or doing something, if there's something that I've done that could actually be reversed or maybe damaged property and didn't fix it or whatever it might be, you can actually do that and say, will you please forgive me? I want to restore what's been lost or stolen or broken. But he wants us to open ourselves up to the Lord, not to examine other people and tell them where they've fallen short, but to self-examine. And also, lastly, when we pass the elements, the, the bread and the juice, the Lord's Supper is for baptized believers. So uh, if you're a guest with us and you're a baptized believer, you're welcome to partake with us. If you uh, are, are not, do not have a personal relationship with the Lord, you've not been saved or baptized, uh, we would ask that you would just let that pass. If you have children with you that haven't yet done that, this is a good teaching opportunity for them to wait and to share the gospel with them. Hopefully they've heard and un understood that today. But we just want you to know that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Then we're going to have our invitation and then we're going to take our Lord's Supper together. Dear Lord, we love you. Uh, we thank you for you counting the cost of what it would take to be our Lord and Savior before the foundation of the world. And you decided that we were worth it, Lord. That is amazing. That you knew that by speaking us into existence, that it would require you to be born of a virgin, to live a sinless life, and to go through the pain and suffering that you went through at the cross. God, we thank you that you did that for us. We thank you for dying for us. We thank you for, for rising from the dead. So you paid for our sin on the cross and you conquered death with the empty tomb, making it possible for us to have a personal relationship with you to not fear death. And God, that is uh, so glorious, Lord. So as we go through things today, as we ha each have our own struggles in life, God, I pray that there's nothing that we are putting above you, that there's nothing that we've been holding on to that's been keeping us from putting you first. I pray for those today that haven't yet made a commitment to you as their Lord and Savior. I pray that today would be the day of their salvation, that when we begin this time of invitation, that they would make their way up to talk to Brother Brandon or myself and just say, I, I need to be saved. God, as you've been dealing with other people with their lives and their personal things, God, we want this to be a time to pour those things out to you as we examine ourselves, as we seek to be right with you, as we seek to be holy before you by the blood of Jesus that we would not hesitate to confess our sins to you. You already know them anyway. And God, that we would get right with you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.